Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome back to another episode of Society Cast, our virtual speaker series. Ahí ahí, ¿verdad? Aimed at facilitating um, insights you still you know, hear me, and inspiration among our network. I'm your host for today. I'm Jill Ortiz. I'm the senior events manager for, for the Alumni Society, and I'm in Chicago today. And to kick things off, I want to encourage all of you to use the live chat and share. Tell us where you're coming from and say hello and let me know if you can see and hear me okay. So in a moment, I'm going to be bringing up our speakers, but before I do that, I want to run through a few housekeeping items and share how the program is gonna go so that um, you know what's happening. So we're gonna have 20 to 25 minutes with, with our speakers, followed by an interactive Q&A session. So they're gonna be doing a fireside chat first and then you get to speak with them. And there are two ways to ask a question. You can submit your questions via the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. And pro tip, if somebody has a question that is very similar to yours, you can upvote that question to make sure that it gets answered. You can also ask a question um, by entering your comments in the chat box. So now I'm going to be bringing up our speakers. Here we go. Hola. Is Annie Lou. Hola, Anilu, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, Mónica. Qué ahí. bueno, qué bueno. Bueno, estamos, eh, no es, no es tu papu de escuchar a Jill, but I, I understand that we were already introduced, and I'm just going to say hi to everybody and to you, Anilu. I believe we have people from California, Illinois, Florida, New York, Puerto Rico, DC, Georgia, and New Jersey. If I'm missing anybody, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, yeah. So thank you for joining us today. And Annie Lou, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you again. Um, today, yeah. we wanted to spend some time talking about the many things that, you know, we talk about all the time, which is the, the changes that we're experiencing these days. You know, think about it. It's only the second day of the second half of 2020. It's July the 2nd, and it's been quite a year already. So we're bracing to, to, uh, to uh, figure out what the rest of the year will look like. Uh, but the world has seen tremendous change. You know, globally and nationally, we have seen crisis on the economic front, uh, health crisis, and also social crisis with the issues that are happening here in the U.S. So we want to talk about those pivotal changes, those that change the course of the way we're operating, the way we live, which are the ones that we're experiencing these days. And you have had several of those pivotal changes uh, from Puerto Rico to uh, Princeton, from being an uh, um, uh, M&A lawyer to being an HR person, uh, from Goldman Sachs to TPG, and then as of late, from Chief Diversity Officer to CHRO. So tell us about those pivotal changes that we can use to figure out lessons learned that you have applied to maybe consider what could we do on these pivotal changes that we're experiencing. Yeah. Bueno, hola, Monica. Hola a todos. Hola. Uh, thank you so much for joining from so many different parts um, of the world, I guess. Um, and I hope everyone is safe and, um, you know, navigating what you've described um, uh, definitely an eventful first half of 2020. I guess that the, the phrase that comes to mind is don't waste a crisis. So I know that there's a lot of suffering right now and a lot of anxiety that all of us have gone to different degrees, some people that really have had a very uh, hard time. And so um, it is it is not um, something to be taken lightly, but I think that the optimism um, that we need in a situation like this um, really brings me to that saying of don't waste the crisis. Um, I do think that um, I've had a number of changes in my career but frankly, my life, as you said, going from Puerto Rico to Princeton, which uh, we can all establish was different. Um, and I learned a lot, um, but I think that a lot of those changes, you know, some of them were deliberate. Um, and, you know, so my change from being a corporate lawyer to going into employee relations at Goldman Sachs was a deliberate decision that that was a different path that I wanted to explore. A lot of the things that happened in my, you know, almost 12 years at Goldman were not my idea. 
And quite frankly, many of the assignments, including the diversity and inclusion assignment um, that in retrospect, um, definitely changed my career. Uh, were not only not my idea, but definitely things that I was not seeking out and kind of did not want to do. And thankfully, some good mentors uh, put some sense into me and uh, and advised me the right way. Um, and then, you know, the change uh, from TPG, um, from Goldman to TPG is not only a change in um, careers um, in role, but actually a whole change for my family moving from the East Coast mm -hmm. to the Bay Area. So I think that for us as um, Latino um, and, and many other people, um, that is a very risky move because it involves, you know, moving your family. It's not just about you. And I do think that that's an area that we have to help each other as a community um, in terms of how we get more comfortable with that type of change that may seem risky, but in many ways um, provides a new opportunity and an ability to, you know, navigate yourself through through a new situation. That that's interesting. The chat wants to know more about your change, and Adriana, hopefully, I'm capturing why uh, your question. I think it was it popped up when you said about moving from the from the East Coast to the West Coast, which I can relate to. It's a hard change. Uh, actually, I lived in the East, on the West, and now in the Midwest. Tell us about your experience. I think Adriana at least wants to know what what was pivotal about that. Yeah, I I think that first and foremost, um, I thought about it as an experience. You know, would this be an experience that would be enriching to myself and to my family? Because I, I do I have a husband, two boys. Um, Monica, I told you, even my parents moved. Yeah. Uh, so this was a whole adventure. I've, I've told other people that there's a book in the works, you know, how to move six Puerto Ricans from the East to the uh, West without losing one. Of them in the process and okay. it was really um you know a family affair uh, like many things have been and i couldn't have um, done many of the things that i've accomplished in my career if it wasn't for the support of my whole family and, and quite frankly many friends that have become family to me being in the states for so long so i think that you know the way that i thought about it was am i gonna learn and am i gonna be able to contribute um and what will make this ex this experience as a human how will i be different mm -hmm. as a result of doing this and also importantly i thought it was very important for a, someone that looks like me to have a job like the one that i have to be the chief human resources officer of a private equity firm that has had the success that tpg has mm -hmm. i thought it was really important uh, for our community to see themselves in a role like that okay and you said that some of those changes were not your idea, you were not seeking them, not even wanting them. And I, I think, you know, like myself and probably many people on the call can relate to that. So, so how do you use, how do you process that, you know, like the similarities that we're living? Nobody wanted a pandemic. Nobody was searching it. Nobody even imagined that that could work. Yeah. Uh, you know, racial inequities have been there for a long time. And we have experienced them as much as the uh, African American experience uh, people have experienced them, and those were unwanted uh, as well. So, so how can we gather your insights from from those moments to applying it to the social crises and economic yeah. crises that we're living? Yeah, I think that there. You know, when I think about the assignments that I were not my idea, and quite frankly, that didn't seem that sexy to me when first presented. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is something that I spent a lot of time um, with my mentees, you know, and with people that I work with in terms of don't expect the next opportunity to come perfectly wrapped for you, mm -hmm. uh, for you to be interested. Sometimes, you know, you need to put a little bit of work and you get to make it your own. But mm -hmm. it's no doubt that it's not always, you know, the perfect job that looks like, mm -hmm. you know, a huge career um, incremental. Sometimes it might be actually a lateral move, but where you're going to get to learn different things. Maybe you get to manage a bigger um, team. Maybe you get exposed to different parts of the organization. Uh, but it was hard because I didn't see that immediately. And really what saved me, as I said, is that I had good um, bosses and good mentors 
who really, you know, said, you're really making the wrong decision here. But I would say mm. you need to be open to that um, advice and to that mm -hmm. feedback and, and not be stubborn, right? About like everything needs to be this perfect uh, projection. So I think that that has been important. When you take that into what's happening, you know, in such an unprecedented situation, like the one we're going through, um, and even if I think about, you know, when I joined Goldman in 2007, then the financial crisis happened the year after, I would say this is a perfect moment for you to volunteer to whatever industry you're in, whatever company to say, hey, there's a lot going on that no one was expecting mm -hmm. to deal with. How can I help? Uh, because you will learn and you will be exposed to things that hopefully we won't be. Um, exposed again. This is, you know, a pretty um, once in a lifetime circumstance, uh, personally, and from a health perspective, as you said, but from a business perspective, there's a lot that will change as a result of what we have gone through in the last, you know, six months. Uh, business models are going to change, different roles are going to emerge, and there's going to be a move in the market in terms of what the trend is and you need to be kind of aligning yourself and studying what that will be and deciding if it's something that you can jump on uh, but i definitely think this is the time for you to to say hey i'm in coach put me mm -hmm. put me to to play that's great you know what you're saying anilu reminds me of uh, you, you mentioned 2008 and the downturn and those things that you're not expecting, right? And sometimes they surprise you. Uh, one thing that I want to add is, uh, because it leads me to another question that we want to know about you, is when do you decide to listen to the advice of, of a mentor, of a boss, of a leader? And when is it that you have to listen to yourself, right? So uh, one of the stories that I'm um, putting in my book, uh, I'm writing a book for those who don't know, it's going to be published, my first business memoir in a few weeks. And one of the stories is about listening to mentors, listening to uh, people that you trust that are advising you to be careful and you listening to your own gut and saying, no, this is what I want to do, which is the reason I decided that I would change my career path from mm -hmm. HR business partner to diversity and inclusion. It was a little bit before the economic downturn and uh, it was risky, risky as well. So, uh, so yeah. balancing, you know, those things that you're indicating, it's something that you have also referenced before you say, Hey, you need to know when to run into the fire and go and take, uh, the opportunity. I don't, I don't like to call it risk because that puts us in a bad mindset, but, you know, take the opportunity. Tell us about that running into the fire that I think is so relevant to today of, of jumping into the opportunity, which you said, even yeah. if, if it's not perfectly wrapped, how does that play out for you? Yeah, I, it is one of my um, kind of ways that I have, um, you know, navigated and running to the fire and it has always paid off. And mm -hmm. I think that the way to do it is, first of all, I think that people need to have a diverse group of mentors. They can not all agree mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. each other and they yes. can all agree with you. Um, and so I fortunately uh, naturally developed some relationships primarily with people that were my clients, um, yes. of people that think about things very differently. And again, I've, I've said before, I couldn't get myself to do everything 100% the way that they were suggesting I do it, but their push really moved me in, in a direction that was different from where I would have started. And so I think that diversifying the advice you're getting is very important um, You know, to that story that you said in your book, because you would have missed a huge opportunity, right? If you had operated from fear. I think that that's the other thing. You need to know yourself and you need to identify when something um, is making you anxious because you just haven't done it before or because there might be a voice in your head that says maybe you can, maybe you can't do it versus something that practically speaking really has you know elements to it that it, maybe this is not the right time to mm. do. And so you will, can only evaluate that and kind of, you know, aggregate the different voices in your head by knowing yourself very well and by being very honest that this time I am hesitant about this um, opportunity because, in fact, I'm a little bit afraid that it's not mm -hmm. going to work out and I need to get myself mm -hmm. over that versus sometimes mentors have um, advice that is good for someone else and not good for you. And that's okay. Um, but I sense. think listening to it is um, still a very important uh, part of the process. 
So, so going into deeper into that, uh, Anilu, you know, like uh, using your analogy of running into the fire and, and overcoming the fear, there are leaders that, as we know, have a lot of fear these days. Uh, they're going into an unknown circumstance. They are trying to figure out how to have const constructive conversations in, in places that they may not feel that they're equipped to do. So how yeah. are you advising your leaders at TPG uh, or even in prior experiences at Goldman Sachs in terms of how to confront those conversations, how to, how to work around the anxiety of talking about racial justice, about health, about well-being, which is related to the global pandemic. Tell us a little bit about how you yeah. advise leaders. Yeah, so I'm very fortunate, Monica, because the, the leadership of TPG is very authentic and uh, they made a decision a uh, long time ago to use their voice and their influence uh, for topics and um, for issues that matter. And mm -hmm. some of those issues at first glance, people looking at a private equity firm, they may not look like your typical issue that a private mm -hmm. equity firm would be involved in. You know, we. Uh, were supporters of DACA, um, you know, years ago when it was being threatened. So we celebrated um, recently as a firm the yes. fact that that conversation is getting back on track. Um, diversity and inclusion has been um, an important topic at the firm that we have put a lot more structure around and uh, behind. And so this moment um, in terms of race racial injustice, race relations, uh, was a pivotal uh, moment for the firm because we um, have the right culture is how I, I say mm -hmm. to people, we have the right leadership, but we like many other firms had not had an honest, candid, open conversation mm -hmm. about race and its relevance to the workplace and how it impacts all of us in very different ways, uh, but particularly for people of color and in this particular instance, the black community, why it was a non-negotiable to not only acknowledge it, but take it as a important set of conversations. So my advice, uh, which you know people were inclined to follow anyway, was be honest, let's be honest. Let's treat this like we would treat any other topic of importance. We would talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so we just got finished actually hosting um, 30 or so roundtables across the firm at all levels with partners of the firm joining with members of the affinity group to facilitate the conversations, but where it was an open forum. And we have been very focused, um, and this is something that has come up a lot in conversations. I'm sure it's coming up for you, Monica. We're very focused on we have to walk the steps, right? So we need to start by talking about it as a firm mm -hmm. and learning more from each other. There was a lot of um, self-awareness um, of what people didn't know before and the responsibility that they have to educate themselves, not to mm -hmm. just pretend like they don't need to. But also we're very focused on action and very focused on making this a long lasting effort. This time it has to be different. You know, mm -hmm. we have been through this um, set of issues before. Um, unfortunately, they're not new. And what I think is new is a different understanding of the responsibility that each person has, particularly people in the majority, uh, to really make this something that they're living as opposed to something that, that someone's telling them about. And yeah. I'll tell you, Monica, uh, uh, something that happened, uh, a comment that was made in the, in the last round table that we had yesterday. Uh, there was a, a white man that said, I realized that, you know, my response is not to like think of my uh, black colleagues as Google and and like ask them all this question. My responsibility is to read, to learn and then to act. Mm -hmm. No, it's 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 so interesting that you say that, because part of what we're finding and your previous comment about the fear is that it's 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 concerning right for leaders to to have these conversations and they may feel ill-equipped but i always think it's like hey this is not the only challenge that you confront that you feel ill-equipped to do but when you are you bring advisors you bring people who are experts on this topic who can educate you right uh yeah. we all learn and, and and isn't that what we're advising leaders all the time to do, to keep being perpetual learners, constant learners, life learners. So learning is part of it. And learning starts with listening to what you may not know. So again, a part of the crucial 
constructive conversation start with that listening listening to the people listening to advisors who might equip the leaders and then you know like learning from those listening and then leading on that space which is absolutely yeah. what we want them to do so yeah. uh but you talked about sustainability uh, uh let's talk about that it should be different this time this should not we have said that you know particularly on the racial front you know the 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 killing of of george floyd has was a moment that has become a movement so how do we make that movement sustainable it shouldn't be like a hurricane that we just think about when hurricane season comes back again yeah and well, that can relate yeah you know, how, how do we yeah. do that yeah and i and this is you know i i also want to make sure given the audience that we have like this is about us too as hispanic people and latino people Yes. And I think that that's really important. I mean, whether you want to accept it or not, all of us have a very complicated relationship with race. Depending on the country that you grew up in, uh, there are a lot of dimensions to that conversation. And we would be very disingenuous if we said that we don't have many of our own biases and many of our own experiences as people of color. Um, so I think that one message that I do want to make sure that we're getting to the audience is we have a very important role to play in this conversation, both as um, advocates um, and also owning the fact that race is also an issue for us. So um, I just I have to say that to my you know lovely fellow um, Hispanics, um, get involved. The second thing is that you know, there is a level of preparation. Um, and Monica, you find this all day long because this is what you do, right? Like diversity and inclusion and equity and access shouldn't be treated as a, you know, hobby. This is something that requires discipline. There's a method to the madness on how to make it work and not. And so I am really focused on getting people disciplined about it because I think that the more disciplined and the more authentic to your company, the more long lasting the efforts will be. And so while I truly believe that there are, you know, frameworks that work that everyone should consider. And, you know, for us at DPG, as I told you, you know, it's not only about us um, in the company, but it's also about um, the 200 or a plus companies that are in our portfolio. And they look very differently. They do different things. Their dynamics when it comes to representation are very different. So I'm not going to solve the problem for each of them. And by the way, exactly. some of them can solve the problem for us. They do much better mm -hmm. than we do, and we learn a lot from them. But I do think that there are certain um, non-negotiables, again, that you need to do. And one lesson that I learned from, you know, four years ago, and I was at Goldman Sachs then when, you know, the um, last set of very um, unfortunate deaths happened, is that from the beginning, you need to be talking to people about the fact that this needs to extend over, you know, the newness of three months of everyone being outraged. Uh, you need to commit to action right away. So one of the things that um, we have done is, you know, put um, meetings on people's calendars to check in on this topic. Um, those people that were really interested the first two weeks put recurring um, calendar meetings commit to check-ins that go and extend uh, beyond 12 months so that you know that you have committed yourself. Um, the other thing is start acting. Yes, so exactly. we um, just finished the roundtables, but we already discussed with our partnership, our initial um, thoughts based on the feedback we've heard from our employees um, and our preliminary updated um, strategy. So hold yourself accountable and hold your firms accountable for acting different. And, and, and I, so I appreciate that you're sharing that about holding them accountable and not making it an issue of the moment. That creates that sustainability. And at the end of the day, I think it's just trying to, to if anything needs to be normalized, is the topic, right? So leaders are paid to manage and, and change, not to be targets of change, to manage conflict, not to be conflict averse. And these are the conversations that are the most meaningful ones. But for whatever reason, you know, talking about, you know, like the issue of race within the Latinidad is something that sometimes we gloss over it, it and we can't. And same with the racial issues, same with pay equity. I mean, we're talking about social issues that we need to call them for what they are and, and have the candid and, and, and 
a real conversation in front of people, not behind doors. Uh, so that is also in terms of if we would handle M&As and you work on M&A in front of people and we will discuss if they were going to be difficult or, or, or not everybody would agree, how is this topic different? It's a business issue. It's an organizational issue. It is because, and people tell me, how do you know that? And I'm like, because it impacts how people show up to work and mm -hmm. whether they can be productive yeah. or not. Yes. Um, you know, Monica, I'm seeing one question just while we're in this topic yes, before we absolutely. leave it about um, how did uh, we get employees talking honestly in the yeah. round tables and did we use a moderator? And I think this is a very important uh, question. It goes to the preparation point that I was making. Um, mm -hmm. So thankfully, you know, obviously I had experience to go through this. There um, is a couple of yes. my team members that do too. Anna Edwin, um, who used to work at Goldman, works for me now. She's the head of talent development, have done this before. So we were fortunate to, you know, come up with the best practices and the guides, but we prepared every pair. So we had a partner and a leader of the uh, um, affinity group and we prepare them and not to be scripted actually part of the script is say what you think share your own story be authentic mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to have that ease uh, for people mm -hmm. and it was interesting the kind of stories that we heard from them actually that they have never shared either and the majority exactly. of the people were uh, white men too so i think that preparation spending some time and we also educated them in terms of our stats um, and the type of things that were on people's mind. And then we just were very deliberate to say, this is an open space. This is a space for you to share and to learn as well. So we communicated a lot about how, what was the expectation? We, mm -hmm. we kept them small also, and it's on Zoom, which is a little bit yeah. different. Um, but the groups we'll keep were- keep it intimate. Yeah, the groups were at max mm -hmm. uh, 15. Um, and I think that really helped um, to create true. kind of a family dynamic. That's true. So we're about to open it up for uh, the questions not to be only on chat. We want to hear people and their voices, but I'll just uh, wrap it up just saying this. This is the opportunity, as you were saying, Anilu, uh, to keep the movement, keep the moment, keep the momentum, and also to engage the voices of people who were not part of the conversation before, right? That's what we have been seeing that is different, that people who were I did, you know, they say, I, I didn't have an opinion on it. I didn't know I was misinformed or uninformed. So how do we make sure that that voices of the awakening, if you may, continues to be engaged? So people don't think that they can take a sideline to it and be just, you know, like ancillary to the conversation. They need to be part of the conversation. So now that, that, now that they are in, let's make sure that they stay in. So let so, me just, yeah. Yeah. No, go I was ahead, just going to say, with respect to that, you you just made a, very, a point that I think is very important. We need to expand the group of people that are involved in this conversation and it, importantly involved in the solution. Um, and we should not make assumptions. You know, I myself have caught myself in the last couple of weeks making some assumptions about where people may stand or That's not true. or what they may have experienced themselves or not. And I've been wrong. So mm -hmm. I just suggest I that, understand. you know, it, it, check yourself. Yes. Well, thank you for that, Annie Lou. And now uh, hopefully I can hear the questions. I cannot necessarily hear Jill, but uh, Annie Lou, you will have to be my ears if I'm not hearing uh, some other questions. So I'm turning it back to you, Jill. Hey. So you can actually look at, um, the, at the question box enough. in the bottom or even in the chat. There's a few there. Yeah. So, Monica, I don't know if you can see the the box with the questions, but I can't. So maybe I'll just start I can see speaking. the question. Yes. Yeah. So one of the questions here is about whether there are any efforts to address diversity in the board. Um, and the answer is yes. And I think that this is a very important topic because again, it, you have to tackle this from every angle. So um, PPG started um, about two years ago a focus on the diversity of the boards on our portfolio company. Um, and we don't have influence over every uh, seat uh, or every board. Uh, sometimes we're not in a controlled situation, but we have mm -hmm. influence even if we don't have the ultimate decision for that um, seed. So we have placed, um, um, there there've been 80 women added to boards um, in yes. the last you know, 18 months. We in December, 
said, we have this framework that has worked from a gender perspective. We need to expand this to be race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working with our um, deal teams and our portfolio companies to make that um, a, a big part of the effort as we move forward. And, you know, we have a database um, that has a lot of very talented, diverse people um, in it. And we are trying to make sure that we partner with other organizations also that could leverage um, exactly. what we have been able to um, get. But so, yeah, diversity in the boardroom is very important. Diversity in the management teams um, is very important. So, Monica, do you want to go to one of the other questions? Uh, are, we, are we all going to put them on? Yes, absolutely. I just didn't know if Jill was moderating or not this part. Okay. So, um, it says here we have a question from Francisco saying, hey, uh, Francisco Estrada, if you have taken calculated risk, Anilu, can you share more about your gut check moments when you had a, to dig deeper and overcome obstacles and hardships in your career and your journey? Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a, the gut check is a, it's a it's an interesting question. I think um, you know I've I got good advice um, from um, a couple of mentors actually many years ago about start to think about like the things that you would like to do, not necessarily the next role, but the type of things that you would like to do and experience before you are at that crossroad. So put yourself, imagine yourself in a decision-making position where you know you would consider things like, would you go on an international assignment? Uh, would you move across the country? Uh, would you take a role that uh, maybe from a title perspective is not evidently a step up, but where the remit is being expanded? So think about those things. And I, I spent a lot of time um, as I look back examining this decision, for example, without even knowing it. So I had done a lot of mental work uh, and work with, you know, my husband, right? Um, would we, if we, one of us thought a really great opportunity somewhere else, what are the areas of the country yes. we would move to or not? We had the conversation of, you know, would we do an international move or not? And then equally, you know, we said, what are the things that would matter to us that like, even if the job was amazing, um, it just wouldn't, fit with where we are in life. And so I, I really recommend people to spending some time when you're like in your you know own with, with your mind calm as opposed to in the pressure of maybe you don't like the job or like maybe you're starting to see that from a career trajectory perspective it's not gonna go where you want it to go. Um, and then I for me, particularly in this last change, um, it was very important for me to know that the organization that I was joining, did, it didn't need to be perfect, but it needed to have a will to care about people matters and about justice, about um, making our ecosystem better. And so you also need to look at yourself in the context of the organization and who you want to be associated with. And um, I think that if you have doubts about how that organization treats, um, other people, um, even if the job is very interesting, I would suggest that you do a lot of diligence um, because if you have that instinct, um, that's probably true and no job is worth you being in an organization that doesn't deserve your talent. Um, and, you know, again, I think that for me, it was difficult to leave a place that I was a part of uh, for almost 12 years. And there were, um, you know, many opportunities that I got at Goldman Sachs that I have made me the person that I am now. I got mentorship. And so it's also equally hard to break away uh, with a place that you feel very comfortable and that you feel um, that that your career has grown. But sometimes um, that's um, something you need to do for yourself. Yeah, no, I agree with you with the discipline factor uh, in, in what you can do and, and, and having a cool head before you get an offer, I think it's extremely important. Actually, I learned some time ago to make a list of negotiables and non-negotiables of the nice to have and must have, because that, you know, with a cool head, you can make those determinations and, and then that, don't get too emotionally involved if that list does not match what you 
what you what you're being hearing from an, a potential employer if that list doesn't match your negotiables and non-negotiables you have to check yourself uh, are you yeah. being honest to yourself so I want to go back to what it was said before uh, and I see some notes on it on the chat about the opportunity to look uh, more in deeply into the intersectionality of race, gender, ethnic, you know, race and gender and sexual orientation with our Latinidad, with our ethnicity. And that's, that's a, a super interesting topic. Como tú estabas diciendo, I think we're all café con leche or a mixture of that, but we have some very deeply ingrained biases in our culture, uh, particularly around race, particularly about sexual orientation. So any thoughts, uh, Anilu, on how you advise your your Latino members on the ERG or even your leaders and how to think about that and how should we think about that as professionals? Yeah, I think that um, we all have so much to learn there, you know, even with all the years um, that I have now spent on this topic, um, every day I hear something that I had not considered from that perspective before. And I think that there is no way but to consider intersectionality. You know, you can't break me away from being Hispanic and a woman. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not gonna happen. And so for us to try to segment um, mm -hmm. these um, conversations um, in the workplace in particular, I think is failure waiting to happen. Um, I also think that, I tell this to people all the time and, and sometimes people get a little bit surprised, but just because you're diverse doesn't mean that you are yourself very aware of diversity and inclusion. So that I think is true. the learning is not just in terms of um, educational, but actually particularly for those of us that are in charge of other humans at work or responsible for their careers, um, you really have a responsibility to listen to the lessons of this um, message. I think that when it comes to sexual orientation uh, in particular, this is a topic that has been under discussed um, in our community for way too long. And it, we're avoiding not only reality, but we are putting aside a very important part of our community, both from a inclusion perspective, but also from a talent mm -hmm. perspective. And so I go all back, all roads to me look the same in the sense of every day, do I have the best team, the best person on every single job? And in order for me to do that, I have to consider everyone's talent, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I think that, um, again, we as a community have a lot of power. The Alumni Society is an amazing collection of super talented, accomplished people. And if all of us go back to our uh, organizations and we say we stand for equality for all, um, and when we talk, we set the example of we understand all the different parts of this conversation, I think we'll all have a lot more credibility, uh, but we're going to attract a lot of allies. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the work that, you know, we're not going to get it resolved uh, with just one group ending up. No, I, I completely agree. You know, what you're saying reminds me of something that has been uh, a choice that I had to make as well, similar to you and those pivotal moments that we have been referencing, because at some point in my life, I was working on as an HR business partner or working in DNI, but I had to live in places that were less diverse, right? in which I was the only one, my family was the only one in which I look ma clarita and my husband is super dark and my, my youngest son is super brown. So we had a lot of like confusion when people saw us out. Are you, what are you? They will speak to me in English until I open my mouth. And then to my husband, they would say, are you black? And then my son, el pobrecito, they don't even know what he is. So it is hard to be the only one in these communities. But, you know, we can learn what that feels like when people cannot put us in a box. Uh, and when I, you see, they see you that you are very, very friendly or familiar or embracing of LGBT, they start wondering as well, what are you? They, it's hard for people to put you in a box. That is hard when you are the only ones. But at some point, it's important to figure out what is the experience that you want to have, not only in, at work, but in life. Very different yeah. experience when I had to move when I when I chose to move to places that were very diverse. That was one of my non-negotiables. 
I would choose to live, particularly when I move here uh, to Chicago, which is so, he has so, so strong racial divides that I would move to a place in which I could live what I aspire to convey to organizations that is possible. So it had to be a place that would, where I could see that every day. So I could say, this is possible, this is how it works, and these are the kind of conversations that you can have when all the concerns, all the fear has gone away. And you just exercise respect and you can have the most crucial conversations right there in, a, in your community, in your street. So, so I think those are the difficult choices that we also have to make uh, and just embrace. It's just, you know, yeah. you choose to make a difference in your world. Yeah. And the flip side of that, Monica, is that I get a lot of people saying, well, this place, this organization is not um, very diverse. I don't know if I want to join. I don't know if I want to work there. And I say, you know, at some point you need to decide, you know, you might be the first yes. one. Mm -hmm. And what we all need to decide is that we're not going to be the last ones. So exactly being right. the first one, probably will happen to all of us. Um, and, and I actually encourage you guys to be the first one. But when you do that, have a plan so that you bring others along. Exactly right. Exactly right. So I know we're a minute away uh, from closing. I hope that this has uh, uh, been a great use of your time. I have enjoyed Absolutely. it every second of it, Ali Lu, speaking with you and seeing that questions and conversations from other people. Sorry that I thought that maybe we were going to get them their voice. I, I was mistaken, but I hope that we have had the opportunity to answer your questions in this way. Thank you, Monica. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anilu. Take thank care. You to both Talk of you. Soon. I appreciate your time today. We're so, so grateful. And thank you also for the audience for making the time to join us. I just want to say that if you want to see this again, um, or if you want to share it with your network, you can go ahead and do that. The replay is going to be available right after this broadcast. And also, we're going to be sending a survey. We would love your feedback. So um, let us know what you want to hear about next and what you thought about Anilu and Monica today. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.